Welcome back to the course titled Strategic Communication for Sustainable Development. My name is Aradhana Malik and I am helping you with this course. And uh, today in this class we will uh, talk about uh, the information and communication technologies and how they can be used uh, for sustainable development. So in planning communication uh, uh, methods, communication strategies for the uh, purpose of sustainable development. Okay, ICTs. What? Communication research has shown that people in economically and socially marginalized communities spend an inordinate amount of time and energy seeking and managing information related to survival and security. People need information. People need uh, uh, information to survive. People need information to feel safe. People need information to feel comfortable. And uh, research has shown that people need, uh, they, they spend a whole lot of time trying to get the information that they need to survive, that they need to feel safe. Then information and the ability to communicate, to receive and impart are necessary but not sufficient conditions for communities to develop and for inhabitants to thrive within them. So the information that we get and the ability to share that information, to make sense of that information are necessary conditions but not sufficient. We need more than just this information, we need more than just the interpretation of this information in order to survive uh, with this information and uh, so in order to survive and thrive within communities and progress within communities. Uh, appropriately designed ICTs can fulfill such needs. So appropriately designed ICTs, what the, the uh, properly designed information and communication technologies can fulfill these needs. And uh, so, uh, you know, the way we use communication strategies, the way we use communication tools will help us understand the community we are working in. People need information. I need to know where I am. I need, need to know what resources I have. I need to know how to use those resources. And information and communication technologies can help us figure through this maze of of data that we have and, and create information out of this data. Okay, some potential benefits to communities from ICT interventions. The first benefit here is the local or regional benefit. Local or regional benefits or we let's go in a geographical uh, uh, way, you know, or, or at least focus on different uh, geographical regions. Local or regional, uh, at the local or regional level, the direct benefits that people have from using interventions, ICT info interventions, are access to local or regional market information for small producers. So we are talking about the profits here. We were talking about the three pillars of uh, sustainable development, people, planet and profit. Now how do we make profits? We need information, access to local or regional market information for small producers then access to information about social and health services. So now we are talking about people, social services, health services, where is the hospital, where are the social workers, what can they give us, the resources we have in order to be healthy, to survive and to be healthy. Facilitation of customer to customer or community to customer transactions, for example, the tourism. And again, we are talking about people and profit here. Improve spatio-temporal relations for NGO work. So, you know, where the NGOs can be set up, how much time will it take for them to be set up, how much time will it take for them to be integrated within the community, etc. All of this can be facilitated through the ICT interventions or interventions using the new and upcoming information and communication technologies. And uh, that is the direct benefit we have at the local level. The indirect benefits of using information and communication technology interventions in uh, you know developing areas uh, are the first one is employment in the ICT sector or jobs requiring ICT skills for family members. So people who are you know once we set up something in a region then the people in that region need to learn to use it. I mean we can't just have outsiders doing things there all the time. 
So, when we uh, when we intervene through or when we go into a community with these latest technologies, the local people get involved and they need to get trained. So, that means that more jobs are created for the local community that we are trying to serve. Better leveraging of human resources in response to community problems. So, uh, you know, we, we use human resources, we use these skills, the skill sets that we come with and uh, uh, the ICTs help us uh, use our or, or, or pitch our uh, human resources in response to community problems in a better manner, more effective manner. Then the next, you know, then we move out of the local area and we move to the national area. The direct benefits in the national context are access to information about legal or policy information. So, you know, let us take the example of the internet. We have websites on which everything is put up. Now, sitting in Khadagpur, I can find out what is happening say in Tripura or in Nagaland or in Himachal Pradesh or in Kutch area of Gujarat or in uh, uh, Kerala or even in the Andamans or Lakshadweep Islands. So, what kind of policies are, are mon or, or you know what kind of policies exist at which level and, and you know and again I will take you to uh, through a uh, very nice initiative that has been going on for the past many many years about connecting uh, uh, you know different people in different regions but then we have access to policy information, legal information where uh, uh, which kinds of policies are being applied in what way, what are the national policies, what are the local policies. So, that is the kind of direct benefit we get by using ICTs, information technology in um, uh, interventions. Then access to information about jobs facilitating business to business transactions. So, uh, that is another um, help uh, we get from these ICTs. Then potential indirect benefits are overall improvement in human development and poverty indices. We help each other, we go as a community, we, we offer support, we, we uh, share our resources across uh, state borders. So, at the national level, this is something that, you know, overall it helps improve the quality of life in different regions of the country. Then at the global level, participation in ICT based systems, for example, trade. You know, I mean, uh, connecting small and medium enterprises are put on the national and international maps through ICTs. Some small handicraft business in one district of Himachal Pradesh can be publicized very easily with or in West Bengal or even in the Kharagpur region. I mean, we, we you know, if, if we meet uh, these people in the villages here through our national service scheme program, we go there, we meet people and they say, I have this very unique thing, can you help me sell it? Put it up on the internet and uh, a lot of people are using it. A an example that comes to mind is the, the use of uh, the water hyacinth or water weed in Assam. And uh, uh, you know, um, I visited Guwahati several years ago and uh, I found this, uh, you know, uh, I found this very nice little workshop next to the, the state emporium. And I went in and they told me that, you know, I said, what are you doing? And they were weaving out of the water weed. Now, that is something very local and you will probably not see it till you actually visit that area in Guwahati. But then, uh, once it is put up on the internet, then everybody sees it, it can be marketed, it can be promoted. I mean, they, they are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, an ecologically sustainable handicraft. They are pulling weeds out of the running water. So, so, uh, they are actually clearing the water, these weeds block the passage of water and they are using it to make handicrafts, hats and bags and all and these things do not get spoiled because the one thing that spoils these things is the fungus and fungus does not grow on them because these things themselves grow in the water. So, you know that kind of uh, symbiotic uh, 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 benefit is there. And so, how do we know about all this? I mean, I visited that place, but a lot of people now know about this because it is up on the internet. So, that kind of thing, that is what happens. Global people outside of India know about this also. So, you know, that is how these things can be promoted. 
access to services provided by international NGOs. I mean, various international NGOs are working in the area of, of uh, poverty alleviation, uh, sustainable development, access to, uh, you know, or promoting renewable and non-renewable, renewable sources of energy, etc. So, I mean, we can just share the information through the world wide, world wide web, we can share the information through various portals on the world wide web. We can, uh, you know, call up people. Things can be broadcast on the, uh, or they can be telecast on the on the television, and so people can come to know about what is happening. You know, various organizations are working in this area. So, overall improvement in human development and poverty indices. I mean, we see all these programs through the through various channels on television. I'm not trying to promote a particular channel, but I'm I'm very fond of the Discovery Channel, History Channel, National Geographic. I mean, these are amazing because they they pick out the the uh, stories like these of of sustainable development efforts of development efforts in various regions the unique stories about how people are managing their resources differently and then they show them and sitting in a small town in west bengal or himachal pradesh or southern india i come to know what is happening in kenya or uganda or or maybe bolivia and and so i can get all this information and replicate things if i need to so we share our understanding of how to deal with our problems and we all sort of you know instead of reinventing the wheel in every part of the world we we share our information we share we come to know how similar we are in terms of the problems we face in terms of uh, uh, the way we can solve them and we all work towards improving the quality of lives that we lead. So, that is one very big benefit. Okay. Challenges to the adoption of ICTs in developing countries, the high cost of failure. Now, ICTs cost money. Information and communication technologies are physically very expensive. They cost money. They are very helpful, but they cost a lot of money. And they may not work in certain areas. They may not be, it may not be possible to have them in certain areas. And uh, in such cases, uh, we end up losing a lot of money, which may not be viable for countries with limited funds. We see the benefits. But unless whatever we put there, unless the technology is not going to change very fast, unless we know that it is there to stay, unless we know that there will be some use of whatever we put in a particular region, uh, you know, we do not want to put it there. And or sometimes what happens is like for example, the cables, you know, we used to have surface cables for everything. Uh, we, we have power lines. We have electricity lines and phone lines, and I've seen this in the in the hill regions, in the mountain regions in India, that phone lines especially. I mean, there's so much of a problem when storms and all come. So you know, uh, trees fall down, and there's snowfall, and then power lines break, and phone lines break, and so you know, initially we did not have uh, 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 phone lines that were beneath the you know the 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 we we used to have open phone lines. And so, uh, these things are then, I mean the local region, in many regions it was not possible to put up uh, poles for uh, for power supply or, or a phone line and it was, the terrain is so rugged in the Himalayan region that you just cannot have these wires and who is going to maintain them. If a wire breaks, then who is going to maintain it? So, all of those problems exist. So, you you do, you, you take the help of the latest technology, you take your cranes, you put a pole there and then the next day there is a snowstorm and the pole falls down. Who is going to go there and repair it? The amount of money it costs to maintain these technologies is very high or in some, in, in some regions where there are a lot of storms and all. I mean, uh, you know, unless you have voltage stabilizers that can handle these very, uh, uh, these extremes of voltage fluctuation, it becomes very difficult to keep uh, the equipment safe. And uh, so, how do you manage with that? So, that kind of stuff is there. Or uh, the air is very corrosive. For example, in the coastal regions, the air is very corrosive. 
So, you know, so how do you maintain equipment and this becomes, it is very expensive and the cost of failure is very high or the cost of the equipment becoming obsolete and being replaced is very high. So, many countries that uh, have limited funds cannot afford it. And social and cultural perceptions about applications of different types of technologies. So, many times technology may be, be a scary thing for people. There are social perceptions, there are cultural perceptions, what do people feel about these technologies, what do they feel about how these technologies are used, what do they feel about how these technologies should be used or what they can and cannot do. And uh, that becomes a problem, that, that uh, becomes difficult to deal with. Many times the society itself does not, for example, the cell phone. Uh, you know, you carrying a cell phone everywhere, I mean, yes, now it's become a necessity and, um, but many times uh, uh, answering a cell phone in the middle of a meeting or answering a cell phone in the middle of a religious function is, is not appropriate or constantly using your cell phone when the elders are talking to you is not appropriate. So, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, the, the applications of different types of technology. And uh, the fix here is community participation and involvement in the design and advertising of ICTs. For example, using, using say uh, um, a phone application to book your train tickets. Now, um, a train ticket booking counter is available in your town, maybe a ticket counter is there and the person who goes there and sits there helps you with your ticket booking and suddenly you have this application on your phone and you just you know, you get a credit card and you use a credit card and your booking is done. Now, this person who is sitting there feels that his importance is going down because of something that has come up on the phone. So, this person may feel left out or the doctors these days are facing this. So, we all check, um, you know, about our treatments with, with Google or um, other uh, internet uh, applications. And so, it becomes very difficult for us to, uh, you know, for, I mean, obviously doctors do not like it when we say, okay, we found this on the net and that on the net and unless whatever we have found is relevant information, our doctors do not want to listen to us. And, you know, you feel, you feel that your expertise is being questioned, you feel that your, your role is being diminished somehow. Sometimes the culture does not accept this technology. So, uh, television, the kinds of programs that come on television, the openness that the television has brought in is challenging cultural beliefs. People see how people in other regions are living, how they are behaving and many times it, it poses a threat to the traditions that are there in any community and, uh, and people who are very traditional who want to preserve the culture in a particular place do not like this invasion of their homes. Uh, uh, you know, by the technology. So, that can be a big limiting factor. Then technical literacy, you know, the fix to the social and cultural pro, uh, to uh, the social and cultural perception is community participation and involvement in the design and advertising of ICTs. You take these information and communication technologies to the community and you get their inputs on how they should be designed. Technical literacy is another issue. How do you train people? How do you train people to use these technologies? That becomes an issue. Then some classes of community based ICT systems. We have two broad classes of community based uh, information and uh, information communication technology systems. The first class is technologies that externalize NGOs or governments by enabling people to interact with processes inside of these organizations. For example, the web based conveniences like the IRCTC. So, uh, uh, Indian Railways, catering and something I have forgotten the full form. Anyway, web based uh, conveniences like the railway booking in India. Then the other is internal systems, uh, technologies that can be used to improve internal processes within organizations that benefit communities. So, externalizing systems are, uh, uh, you know, you have these web based conveniences and uh, various levels of the externalizing systems are level one externalizing services provide one way communication for displaying information about a given agency or aspect of an organization. So, you go to the website of a particular um, organization 
or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, ministry or some place and a whole bunch of information is listed on their website that is level 1 externalizing services it's one way communication and the purpose of this communication is to give you information level 2 externalizing services are the services that provide simple two way communication capabilities usually for simple types of data collection such as the registration comments or requests within an organization so you can make requests but these requests you know the and the organization may answer them it is simple two way communication but it is still more of a process of data collection or registration of comments people ask you for feedback you provide the feedback it's not really two way but some channel is open for you to give your comments then level 3 externalizing services extend on the level 2 services to provide the ability to carry out complex transactions that may involve intra organizational workflows and contractual procedures for example vehicle registration so it's not you giving feedback it's you doing something through that service so or your uh, you know ticket booking for example so uh, uh, you provide the necessary infrastructure over there and uh, you know you get one thing done then level 4 externalizing services are the characterized by the emergence of portals that seek to integrate a wide range of services across whole sectors regional bodies or geographically distributed organizations for example we have the enterprise resource planning system in many organizations so you have one portal you log in and through that portal you can check your salaries you can enter the grades of the students you can find out uh, you can you can make requests for leave you can put in your leave applications you can uh, uh, make requests for your project etc so a whole bunch of things is done through just one login system so that is level 4 externalizing systems of course this is for an internal thing but then maybe you know one stop shop for uh, for doing everything related to your tax so income tax returns filing of income tax returns checking pre past years returns uh, maybe it's linked to your bank account or your bank account you know uh, generates a whole bunch of things so you can do various types of transactions so that's level 4 externalizing service i think that's a better example your bank you can transfer money you can pay your bills through the bank account you can send money abroad you can pay your fees you can pay your electricity bill you can also pay your taxes through your bank account so that's level 4 externalizing service that through one portal you can do a whole bunch of things in a particular domain and here it is payment of money to government agencies so the bank is not only a place where you store your money it is also a one stop shop for paying any money that you need to pay to any government or non government agency but this is where you know the money is i mean uh, it's being tracked but at least you have to just you know uh, through a few clicks you can connect to different portals that is the externalizing systems now internal systems are integrative and communicative systems these are systems that provide support for inter organizational integration and cooperation these types of systems can enhance the sharing of data and coordination of processes in and among organizations so this is what happens inside the organization for example the intranet we have in organizations domain specific processing and knowledge management systems these are systems that provide support for processing and interpretation of data within ontologies that are unique to a government or a to to an organization community or government for example the processing of population data agricultural statistics etc so you have processing and knowledge management and we have integrative and communicative systems these are internal systems that take care of the work that happens within an organization it's not the dealing of the organization with the external customers now taking this to the scope of sustainable development the um, uh, the application of externalizing systems would be the uh, contact that the community has with particular ngos or the local government maybe the government can have a single office and uh, so you know you have information offices that would be a level 1 place you go to the office you pick up a pamphlet or there's one person who's just responding to your queries let's take the example of ticket booking counters in india you go to the ticket booking counter there is one counter you know you have a series of counters so 8 10 people sitting in a row the first one is only the information 
person. So, inquiry is its way. So, you go to the inquiries uh, desk and you can ask them any question about uh, you know when the train is coming, you know the status of your ticket, etc. So, that is level 1 externalizing service where their only uh, work is to give you information. Level 2 externalizing system would be uh, feedback forms in your uh, uh, ticket uh, uh, train ticket counter. So, you have feedback forms, you fill out the form and you drop it off in a box. Level 3 would be to carry out complex transactions. So, you know you have one counter, you can go to the same counter, you can book the ticket, the same person will also help you cancel your ticket, the same person will also help you change. I mean in trains we do not have change of date, but it is just booking and cancellation. So, that can be done. Then level 4 would be again you know I, I cannot think of an example where you could do everything at one counter, but maybe the, the example of the bank would work. So, this is the kind of thing that we do you know when we talk about community development maybe one office is dealing with, with this and different people in the office have different tasks and the level of complexity decides the level of externalizing services and internal systems we take technologies, we have computers that help us run the organization. So, that is how these things um, uh, you know that 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 is a very simple explanation of, of how uh, we, we deal with complexities, we deal with problems in our own environment. Now, that is all we have time for in this lecture, but we will take this discussion about information communication technologies further in the next lecture. So, thank you very much for listening.